Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. We're going to be in Luke chapter 11. So if you've got a Bible, Bible app, anything like that, go ahead and turn there. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, this line, teach us to pray, actually comes from Jesus' disciples. Uh, because on one hand, you're like, everyone can pray. You just, just talk to God, just start praying. God's there. God's listening. God loves you. It's very, very simple. And yet there was something about Jesus that they were saying, teach us. I remember teaching my kids how to walk. I remember that first time as they were, you know, doing that. And it's, it's interesting because why do they even want to learn to walk? Why not just crawl your whole life? I mean, you can get from here to there, you're fine. But what happens is they see that the adults or if they have older siblings, they see them walking and then they're going, I want to do that. I want to. And so then they start pulling themselves up on things, or if you have low-hanging anything, they start pulling those things down and ruining things. Yeah, oh, I got I to gotta change the way my house is again. And then they start pulling themselves up, and then you get things to strengthen their legs, those little bouncer things. You know, you're just doing this over and over and over again. And then and I remember those days where you start, then you start, you're holding their little tiny hands and helping them take the steps. And then that day comes where they finally go, I can let go. And they take those steps and it's just so fun because they got these chunky legs, but it's still, it's just like, you know, it's like this, you know, and then they flop down and then you cheer them on and they're smiling. And then they realize I can do it. I can do it. I, I can do this. And it's very quick after that. It's very quick where they go, I got it now. I can do this. And then your life changes as a parent because now they're everywhere and you got it's a very, very different world once that happens. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Jesus was in a certain place praying. Can we just stop there, right there? I just think, I mean, I know this isn't that crazy, but it's kind of crazy. Jesus prayed all the time. Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is God incarnate, talked to the Father all the time. And I just think that's one of those things where you're going, if Jesus needed to pray, then I definitely need to pray. You know, it's weird for us as we go, I shouldn't bother God. God's got enough going on. And I just want to challenge you again and again and again. This sermon series is super simple, right? But it's hard to do. Because we have all of these, all this kind of built up, solidified, hardened ideas in our heads that are not from the Bible. They're built up in our own heads of like, this is how God is, and this is how God works, and this is how prayer is. And it's really hard to, it's almost like calcium deposits, right? It's really hard to get those things out of our brains. Jesus prayed all the time. You're not going to bug God. He's not too busy for you, right? That's not going to be the problem. Jesus prayed so often Here's what happens. And as he finished, one of his disciples came up to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. If you know anything about Jewish culture, they had already been taught to pray. It's not like they didn't know how to pray. You know how to pray. Everyone was like, I can talk to God, right? There's an old joke that as long as there is tests, there's going to be praying in school, right? Like there's always been people, God help me. Okay, problems, situations things going on, and yet there was something, something different about the way Jesus prayed. That's what I want you to hear. That's what I want you to see here. Something was different about the way Jesus prayed that the Jewish culture growing up, our American culture right now, isn't inherently teaching us. And then the question for us as Jesus followers is, are we going to follow the way he taught us to pray, or are we just going to go, this is the way I pray, and there's nothing wrong with prayer. And I just want to underline that. There's nothing wrong with however you're praying. Right? But Jesus is teaching us how to pray. He has a different relationship with God, and he wants us to live that out. And how we pray actually affects that. So here's what Jesus went on to say. It says, this is, anyone reading along with me? What does it say there? This is what? How. This is how you should pray. We'll talk about this in just a minute. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. 
And uh, in some versions, especially in Matthew, it has that last part. We all know yours is the kingdom, power and glory forever. Here's basically six parts of the Lord's Prayer. If we were to break this down, the first is the beloved relationship. You have a relationship with God. God is Father, right? You actually live that. We're going to talk about this today. Second is praise and honor. This is in most people's prayer. God, thank you for this. God, I praise you for this. Okay, we typically call this praise. God's will and God's way. Okay, praying every day, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Not this is what I want, this is what the other person wants, this is what our country wants. This is, God, may your will be done. Third is your needs, your give us today our daily bread. Again, this is the other one that's in most of our prayers. We typically call it praise and prayer, right? And we have all these other acronyms the church has come up with over the years of things like you should add into your prayer life. All good, all good things, all good things. But Jesus actually taught us here are the ingredients to add into your prayer life. And what's wild to me as Christians is we don't even pay attention to this. We don't go like, oh, every day I should be praying for forgiveness and to forgive others. And every day I should be praying for strength against temptation. And we're missing this. Jesus taught us how to pray. And as Christians, we're like, we're totally Jesus followers. We just don't follow how he taught us to pray. And I don't think it's really complicated. I just think we should do it. I just think if he says, here's these six things, then we should pray these six things. I want to say to you, I think it's good every day to actually pray the Lord's Prayer, like literally word for word. But I think it's good to stop at each one and then go, okay, my heavenly father, and then stop and then pray that category. God, you're my father. I need to remember that first. I need to receive from you like you're my dad. I need to not worry about things like if I was out with my dad, right? Like he's got it covered, right? God, your name is holy. We're going to talk about those two things. You, you pray it, and then you pray it. You know what I mean? You say the actual line, and then you say the category. And I think that just changes our prayer lives. And here's kind of the point I'm really trying to get to today to set the tone for the whole series. The way you pray changes how you think, changes how you act, changes how you feel. Your prayer life is super important. And if you think it isn't, because you don't pray very much, that's probably affecting your life. Because you're not praying very much, so you're basically saying, and let me, let me know if this is kind of what comes out of your mouth. It's up to you to do it on your own. People need to figure out their own problems. People need to be pull up their bootstraps. Because you don't really need God, so no one else really needs help either. How you pray changes how you think, changes how you feel, changes how you act, changes everything. We're going to talk more and more about that, but you know, we should probably, you know, pray. So let's pray. Let's jump in. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Be with us as we unpack this prayer that you taught us a prayer. It's not complicated, God, but if we're honest, we're not doing it. I know I wasn't doing this years ago, Lord, and it's changed my life since now that I'm doing it. Lord, I just pray for us that we can put this into action today. Praise in your name. Amen. Uh, if you want one of these little book cards we made, we thought some people might want this. You can grab one, you can get them up here. They're on the events table on the way out the door. Uh, so this has the six categories that we're talking about. Let's start with God as our father. God's our father. Here's the weird thing with dads. We've all had a different relationship with our dads. But God's our heavenly father. We're going to get more to that in a minute. But to begin with, to begin with, very, very important. God is relational. God is relational. Your, this is a little philosophical, but your relationality, your ability to have relationships with people is not higher than God's. It comes from God, which means God feels more than you do. God is more relational than you, not less. But here's what we do. We turn God into an idea, an abstraction, an entity, a far away, uh, sort of unmoved creator. Meaning we are more personal than God in that idea, which is not true. And I wonder when we pray to God, how would we feel if we were saying, if someone was saying to us what we were saying to him? Hey, thanks for all the stuff that you do for me. And I need you to do this to me today. And I wonder at the beginning, if we just came to God as God, you're my father. I have a relationship with you. Can we just be together a little bit? Can I listen to you? Can I spend time with you? Can you just be my father? Can I just remember that you're my father? 
Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches if you abide in me. I mean, how many of us can just abide in God? We always got to be moving. Like, but you can totally hang out with your friends. But I will tell you, it takes a long time before you can just hang out with God because at the beginning, it just feels like you're uncomfortable and you're talking to the wall and you're saying stuff to the air. But over time, you're like, I can actually, God's my father. I know it. I know his love. Can't deny it. Can't deny him. And you can just be with him. And I think as Christians, we're all trying to love people with God's love. Right? Is that kind of our, our goal? We don't want to love with our own love. We want to love with God's love. But how can we give what we don't got? If we're not filled up with God's love, then when stress comes and pressure comes, we're going to react with our human reaction. Have you ever seen a Christian react in kind of a non-godly way, more of like a human, stressful, typical way? Have you ever seen that happen once or twice in your life? Have you ever seen that happen? Could it be possibly because Christians aren't spending time every day filling up their lives with God's love, the love of the Father? Could you imagine if God's children every day just said, I need to just get filled up with you, right? If you have young kids or if you remember being a young kid, you just wanted time every day for just cuddle time, snuggle time. Some of you call it nuggles, right? When did you grow up and get too old for God? When did you grow up and get too old to say, God, I just need to rest near you? There's this picture in John at the Last Supper, and it said that John leaned over and put his head on Jesus' chest. And in John chapter 1, it says Jesus himself dwells near the Father's heart. The word literally is right here. That intimacy, that closeness that God actually died so that we could have with the Father every day. We could have that level of closeness and him pouring into us. And what's crazy as Christians is we go, I'm too busy for that. Yeah, Jesus, just forgive my sins. I don't really want intimacy with God, life-changing, pouring relationship into me. I don't know that I want that. I got my life. I got my agenda. I got my things. Just forgive my sins. Help me. Let's move on. Let's go. Right? How you pray changes how you think, how you feel, how you act. Imagine just with me right now, taking time every day in your prayer life and saying, God, before I do anything, I need to receive from you. I need you to pour into me. Imagine if your posture first, before you have all the things you need to do, was God, I need to receive. I need to learn how to rest in you. I need to learn how to receive your love. Imagine that. Rick Warren said this, your problem is not that you don't love God enough. Your problem is you don't understand how much God loves you. And I think this is a major problem for most of us and if you spend time every day, every day, every day, every day, every day going, God, you love me. God, you're my father. God, you accept me. It's going to change your life. It's going to change everything. It's huge. But of course, God's not the same as our earthly dads. And this is what's hard for us. So many times I've talked to people, especially when I was a youth pastor, and they're like, there was this guy. Right? He was about 15 years old, had a very tough relationship with his dad. His dad was, this guy wasn't that big, it wasn't that small, but his dad was six foot six, 250 pounds, super big guy, and also a no nonsense, this is the way it is, there's no point in arguing with me because you're not going to get your way. And this teenager just felt frustrated and defeated all the time. And I would talk to him and I'd say, you know, look, you got to understand that God's not the same as your dad because in his mind, God was exactly the same as his dad. There's no point in talking to him. He's always right. God's way is just going to be the way it is. And he was now trying to rebel against God and against his dad. So he didn't want to be in church, but he was forced to. And I'm trying to relate to him as his youth pastor going, look, this is not the way God is. And it's probably not the way your dad is either. You're just probably having some frustration things because I was a new dad at the time too. And so they were struggling with that. And I remember having this breakthrough with this young man. We're at a camp and we're talking. I've been talking about this for months. And we finally, we've been looking at Romans 8, where it talks about God bringing us in, calling us, or having us call him Abba, which is what Jesus taught when it says our father, almost guaranteed in Aramaic, that's Abba. Abba is not daddy. 
but it's also not what many of us think of as fathers, probably somewhere in dad range. And I just want you to get kind of a tangent off my story, but I want you to just make sure you understand that Jesus revealed God is not a distant, disciplinary God that's far away. He is holy. He gets to that very next thing, right? It's not this gaga dad dad thing, but it's also not father way far away. You can use whatever word you want. But for most of us in our culture, to think about God as our dad would blow us away. And that's what blew them away, that Jesus revealed God as Abba. And we're looking at Romans 8, and the kid's like, okay, I, I get it. I see what you're saying. I, I hear it. I hear it. And then we're looked at, we looked at Luke 11, and we looked at we're, Isaiah 43, where is, God says, I've chosen you. You are mine. And then finally one day, this kid had a breakthrough, and he actually got, no, you mean God loves me? You mean God does that for me? I know he just does it for everyone. I know God just cares for everyone. But sometimes we get lost in that generic love, right? God just loves everybody. And then finally it hit him. You mean God loves me? God loves me. And finally, this kid could understand. And I believe that if a teenager can get it, then you can get it too. That God is not the same as your dad. Because all of us growing up, therapists will tell us, that all of us begin our God understanding through our parents, especially our male parent. And for many of us, that screws us up. And so we can come to that spot where we can go, God is not the same as my dad. My dad loved me well or not, whatever that relationship was, but God is not the same as my dad. And I have to say that to my kids too. And they have to unpack, what does that mean as pastor's kids? Because faith is involved in that and how that all wraps together. But to say, you have to establish your own relationship with your heavenly father. And I say to them, I'm only your dad for a short while. My prayer is that I get to be your brother forever. Right? He had this breakthrough and my prayer is that you can have that breakthrough as well. That you could start every prayer, not with a homework assignment, not with things to do, but you could just start with God being your father. God being your father will change everything. If you don't have that ingredient in your prayer life, and most people I know don't, start there. Start there. Just open every prayer with God. You're, you're my father. You're my father. I'm loved. Jesus kind of made the point in the verses that follow, verses 5 through 13. We'll look at those right now. And then teaching them more about prayer, he used the story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight. Some of you, that's late. Some of you, that's not. Uh, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine's just arrived for a visit. I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. I've already locked the door. My family and I are in bed. I can't help you. And Jesus says, but I'm telling you this, even though he won't do it for your friendship's sake or your neighbor's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will eventually get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. It's almost rude, right? Like you're just like, I have to get bread because my friends come over. And so Jesus goes on to say this. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. In Greek, you probably, many of you know that words of ask and you will find. Seek. But in Greek, those words are meant to be ongoing, which is why the translation says keep on doing. That's good translation there. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the doors will be open. So many of us are reading this parable and going, wait a second, are you saying that God is like the neighbor in bed who doesn't want to get out of bed to help us? Is that what you're kind of saying? Like, like I got to keep shameless persistence. I got to knock on the door and God's like that. No, God is not like that. And Jesus is going to make that point right away. His point is this, and this is called an argument from lesser to greater, which means if even a neighbor will get out of bed in the middle of the night because you're knocking persistently, how much more will God, who loves you, answer your prayers if you keep on asking? Because you are dealing with an entity that's not human. It, Jesus became human, but he doesn't answer the same way we do. He answers in different timing. Sometimes he waits because it's going to help you. And if you've had friends or you've had employees or you've had kids, 
you know that sometimes you can't give everyone what they want right when they want it. Sometimes it's not the best for them. You know that sometimes even their struggle or even their pain is for their growth. And our God is always good, even though our life is not always good. Right? And God's at work, even as we go through this. But God is not like a person in bed who has to be rudely interrupted to get downstairs. Jesus' point is, if even a friend would get up, how much more will God? But to get where we're going, prayer requires perseverance. You got to keep going. You got to keep saying, God, I'm not going to quit praying. I'm not going to stop this habit of prayer. I'm not going to stop trusting in you. I'm not going to stop reaching out. I'm going to keep doing this over and over and over and over again. And even as we look at these six categories, my question is, can you do those things over and over and over again? Can you persevere in those categories? Here's what Jesus goes on to say. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Any dads in here that like that? Some of you, maybe, okay. Toy snake, maybe, okay. If they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Jesus says, of course not. So if you and your sinful people, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit the greatest gift to those who ask him. That's what it means to be a Christian. Hear it, don't miss it, because it really goes with everything we're saying. God himself comes to live inside of you. We're gonna do the next section here in just a minute. But let's stop, let's do a little prayer time. So you, however you wanna pray, leave your eyes open, you can look up in the sky, you can close your eyes, whatever. But I just want you for a second to reflect as you kind of talk to God in your own head. Can you just call God Father or Dad? Can you admit maybe that you haven't tried to really do the relationship thing with God in your prayer life? It's just more like, here's what I need. I got to rush through it. And can you just say, hey, Father, Dad, I want to get closer to you. I want to spend more time with you. I know you're with me every minute, but I actually want to spend time talking to you, hanging out with you. Dear Lord, it is the greatest joy in life to have a relationship with you. And I pray. Father, I pray that we don't miss it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, next section is holy is your name. Simple version. Again, many of us do this. You're praising God. God, thank you for this. Thank you for what you've done. Super important. Gratitude changes so much. Gratitude helps with our anxiety. Gratitude is such an important part of life, how you look at life, having that in your life. So, so huge. Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, someone gave me a challenge to come up with a gratitude list. And it's so crazy because it takes a long time. I mean, it just, I had to do it over a course of a few days because it kept growing and growing and growing. How many things we have to be thankful for. And every time I'm feeling depressed or anxious, I just open up that list and it's weird. I just feel better, right? There's so much to be thankful for. I encourage you in that. But this is a little bit different. It's not just God, thank you for this. It's about God's name is holy. Now, the way this is in the original language, it has two different ways you can understand it, and I think that's intentional, okay? The first is that you need to remember that God's name is holy. The word holy not only means pure, which most of us think of, it also means set apart. It's not the same as our names. That's why we don't use God's name in vain and all that sort of stuff, right? That God's name is holy. We remember that we're dealing with a holy God whose ways are not our ways, who does things differently, who answers prayers differently, it's a little bit different. Um, and I think that's just really important. I remember when we were doing Building Hope, uh, kind of our capital initiative, we talked about that in March, and I challenged people in our church to pray for 10 minutes twice a day. And you know what's so great about that challenge? People came up to me and said, I'm going to do it. I'm in. And many of those same people came up to me afterwards and said, this is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. 
10 minutes is long. There's a lot in 10, like that's, that's 20 minutes a day. I'm like, I know it's almost like a whole TV show. And they're like, okay, thanks a lot, Scott. Right. Okay. And, and they went through that stuff. I'm like, I know I get that. And, and they were struggling with that, but they were in, they were doing it. They prayed for five weeks in a row, twice a day and doing that. One of the best ways to grow your prayer life is to add these ingredients in. If you stop and say, Father, if you stop and say your name is holy, we're only like two sentences into the Lord's prayer and you might be five minutes into your prayer. Like, yo, I just need to stop and remember that God's my father. And you're going to find like, man, and this is what's going to happen. I, I promise you, you're going to go, I'm running out of time for prayer. I've never had this problem before. I've always been like, oh, 30 seconds. What, what else am I supposed to say? Right? I mean, God already knows everything. So why do I need to tell him? Right? Well, because God's relational and he likes to hear your voice. He actually likes your voice. And some of you are like, how could God like my voice? I hate my voice. Right? Well, how did you, if you had kids, how did you like your kids coloring? Why did you put it on the fridge? That's how God feels about you. God is crazy about you. And God's name is holy. And you remember that, God, you are holy. I need to remember that. You put that in your prayer life. Your prayer life's going to grow. The second part of this is this may it's kind of a, it's called in, in grammar it's called a subjunctive it's like god your name is holy but may your name be holy and here's the crazy thing right you and i we bear the name of jesus the name that says in the bible that before whom every knee will bow every tongue will confess that jesus christ is lord we have that name on us we are christians which means we're supposed to be living the way of jesus praying the way of jesus Loving with Jesus' love, not reacting in our typical way or our personal way or our human way or our political way. We respond as Christians. How would Jesus respond to this question? How would Jesus think about this topic? That's how we are trying to live. We're trying to be his representatives on earth because he lives in us. And what we're praying, what you're praying in this prayer is not just, God, thank you for this. God, you're awesome about this. You're also praying, God, May your name be holy through me. You're not going to get it right. You're going to mess up, which is why later in the prayer, you're asking for forgiveness. You don't, you're not expected to get it all right, just like any father doesn't expect their kids to get it all right. You come to God as an imperfect person. He knows that. That's why he died on the cross. You're forgiven. But you are praying, God, may your name be holy. And I want you just to think about, because it goes right into, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done. I want you to think about praying that every day, God, may your name be holy through me, through what I do. May your name be glorified. Because all of us have this ambition, like what we're trying to do or what we're trying to be comfort. What if your daily ambition was, God, I want to live to bring glory to your name today. If I'm home resting, may your name be glorified because God is glorified in your rest. Amen. If you're at work, God, may you be glorified. May your name be holy. May your name be sanctified. May your name be magnified through my work today because I work for you more than I work for any supervisor or boss. God, may you be glorified in my vacation. May you be glorified in my TV time. May you be glorified in my time with friends. May you be glorified in my time at school. God, may your name be holy. I want to pray that every day. How you pray changes how you think. Changes how you feel, changes how you act, changes everything, right? Imagine that. And I want to add one more thing here. When we say, God, thank you, I want to encourage you. Don't just thank God for what he's done. Try to figure out how to adore God for who he is. So God, you didn't just save me. God, you're savior. You're always faithful. You are always good. What you may not know is right now, God's character is the biggest thing questioned by people. Most people don't think God ever does good things. They just don't know if God is actually good. Is God faithful? Is God good? Those are the questions people are asking. And this is going to be part of our prayer lives. Let me ask you guys this question. How many of you have a special recipe that you actually love, the one that you actually make. I'm not talking about something that you make from a box. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. If that's, unless you add special ingredients. 
a few people here, a few more people. Let's, let's shout out a couple of your favorite little recipes. You don't have to give away your secret ingredients or anything here, but like, what, what do we got? What do we got? What, what's over here? Chicken noodle soup. Ooh, quiche, someone said, I heard. Chocolate pie. Is that what you said? Chocolate pie. Ooh, that sounds good. Ice cubes. Ooh. I will say that Brent is very particular about his ice cubes. There, there's, a, there's a special type of ice cube for people. That's right. Peanut butter cookies. Oh, my favorite. All right. It's like Carol's in my life group. Okay. So different ingredients. Now, how many of you would say the ingredients matter and how you mix the ingredients matters? Right? You're not just like pouring sugar. It's fine. Right? And I know this because... I remember making homemade cookies for well, like one of my first times. It wasn't probably my first time following, you know, the cookbook, you know, thing, which I didn't know what all the ingredients were. And I forgot, uh, I forgot baking powder, right? And don't, don't judge me. It's my own daughter, my own daughter. We talked about how your father is not your heavenly father, okay? So I just want to say that, okay? And, and here's the thing. There's still sugar in there. There's still flour in there, but they tasted so bad. And no amount of chocolate chips could cover it up. The taste was terrible. We threw the whole batch out. The ingredients matter. You, you leave out a couple of ingredients, the whole thing's going to taste differently. Some of it may not taste great at all. Here's what I'm trying to say. Jesus gave us six ingredients. What's going to happen to people, to Christians, to his people, if you leave ingredients out, what's going to happen if God's people day after day leave out that God is father could eventually they stop treating God like a relationship could eventually they stop when they come to church. They're not actually singing to someone. They're just singing or not singing because they don't like singing. doesn't matter if they're singing to someone whose name we want to be holy. We don't really need to sing because I don't really want to sing because it's really about what I want. Oh, wait, that's the next one. May your will be done, not my will be done. What happens when we leave ingredients out? What happens when Christians, maybe in our culture, stop praying every day, God, forgive me the way I forgive other people. God, forgive me the way I forgive other people. What happens when we stop saying, God, what did I mess up? Eventually, we start going, I don't mess up. I'm a pretty good person. I got my life figured out. And we become judgmental people. Do you think maybe that's happening? And what would happen if Christians started praying every single... And I can't change the whole world of Christendom, but I want to ask our church to take the challenge to pray this Lord's Prayer every day with all six ingredients. And what if every day you just said, God, where have I messed up and how can I forgive others? What if every single solitary day you said, God, here are my temptations. Help me to overcome those temptations with your Holy Spirit and with accountability from your people. Because God wants you to have both. Maybe we would get out of that idea that we have everything right because we never share anything wrong. Because we're not even sharing with God, so there's no way I'm going to share with somebody else. What if those ingredients were in our prayer lives? In addition to the good things we have in our prayer lives, which is praise and needs, which are super important. There's two of the ingredients. But... No cookies are made with two ingredients. You see what I'm saying? And some of you are already like, oh, baby. okay. I'm not a baker, so I don't know, right? I'm just going to say it, right? Okay. You guys understand my point though, right? If you miss some of the ingredients that matters, and I want you to turn it around, what would happen if every day, every day, you said, God, your kingdom come today? May your will be done. Starting today, starting right now, today. May your will be done today. I live for your glory. What would happen if you did that 300 times a year? 365 times a year. That would add up to over 1,000 times in a decade. And then 10,000 times. Do you think that would change your life if you were praying that way? Father, holy, kingdom, Here's my needs. Forgiveness. I'm a person who's made to be forgiven and to forgive others. Temptation and then back to glory. What difference would that make in your life? And I know this because I've lived it. Because I heard someone challenge me on this, this very simple challenge. How you pray changes how you think. 
feel, and act. I had someone challenge me on that and I started doing it and it's totally changed my life. When you start praying every day, Father, suddenly it's weird because you're around other Christians. You're like, don't you see God this way? But you realize, how do you make up for 10,000 prayers? It's not something you just get because you all get it. You all mentally get it. It's something you got to practice and do day after day after day after day after day over and over and over and over and over, and over, and over again. God, your Father. And you got to finally, slowly break this performance mentality that's so big in our world. And you finally go, God, you're my father, not my earthly father. You're my heavenly father. God, you forgive me. It just changes and it changed me. And when I started praying for God's kingdom, suddenly it was the craziest thing to go. It doesn't matter what I want. It matters what God wants. And I found myself being sold out. And that's a weird word in our term. Like some people are sellouts. But when you're sold out for God, when you're sold out for a cause, it's like that's something worth selling out for, giving all for. And my life just changed. Some of you think I was always this way. No, I, I wasn't. How I prayed changed me. And I want to encourage you as we come to the Lord's table, as we sing our final song, to start the journey. To start the journey, to take the challenge. And I want you to think about that as we close. Are you willing to take the challenge to pray the ingredients of the Lord's Prayer, the sections, call them whatever you want, every single day? Doesn't mean you're going to get it perfect. Your prayer life's going to get longer. Your walk with God's going to get deeper. Your faith is going to change. All because you do something super simple. Just pray the way Jesus taught us to pray. You're not doing it wrong. You're just not doing it righter enough. Right? You're not praying wrongly. Your, pray your prayers are fine. There's no wrong way to pray. But Jesus taught us how to pray. I think, crazy thought, let's do it. Let's pray right here as we wrap up. God, thank you so much for my brothers and sisters in here. Thank you that you taught us to pray. Lord, be with us as we go through these steps that you are our Father. Lord, that we pray that may your name be holy. We thank you for who you are for all that you've done. Lord, may your kingdom come in the next 10 minutes in this room, in the next day for 4th of July. Lord, beyond, may your will be done. We know that we live in a world where so many are not trying to do your will. Help us to be people of love and influence. Lord, we pray for the needs of our world we pray for those who are hurting. We pray for our own needs. God, help us to not live more than we need. We remember that you prayed for daily bread. Lord, we pray for forgiveness. We come to you remembering that we are sinners. We aren't the saviors of the world, God. We are not the ones who have all the answers. You just asked us to point to the one who does. Help us not to try to take your place. Help us to forgive other people. Help us in the way that we forgive others to show that there is forgiveness. And Lord, help us to overcome temptation because we all struggle with it. Lord, we pray and know that yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. We're going to watch a little video here on the Lord's Prayer.